It's time for Time for Truth It's time for Time for Truth It's time for Time for Truth It's time for Truth Then, uh, can you explain us the, the most important conclusions about this book? The psychiatry book? Yes. Yes. I have studied psychiatric research for nine years now, mm -hmm. and I have studied it very carefully, and I have dug very deeply into the literature. And when you dig very deeply, the skeletons come up. The buried skeletons come up of the ground, you know? There are so many things that have been hidden. And uh, some of the things that have been hidden are many of the deaths that psychiatric drug cause. Uh, often the drug companies omit suicides and other deaths from their clinical trial reports that they publish. So psychiatrists and other doctors don't know how dangerous psychiatric drugs are because they cannot trust the published literature. Most of the research is done by the drug companies that have a huge interest in hiding serious harms of their drugs. I have come to the conclusion that uh, the way we use psychiatric drugs does far more harm than good. We use them far too much. We kill many people and we cripple many people. We create permanent brain damage with many of the psychiatric drugs so that people have difficulty coming back to a normal life. And it would be far better if we use psychiatric drugs very, very little. At, at, most, <coughs> at most, only 2% of what we use today. And uh, since it, it is impossible to ever make doctors come down to this level where they use these drugs so little that they do more good than harm. That cannot be done because you have the drug industry that is very wealthy and it lies about its drugs all the time, both in marketing and research. And then you have the financial incentives uh, and the dream about a quick fix. I have a problem. <coughs> I'm, I'm depressed. I, I have an acute psychosis or whatever. Oh yes, here is the pill that will cure you. And what's the solution for this? Which is wrong, because psychiatric drugs cannot cure anybody. They can just make the symptoms a little, a little less uh, mm -hmm. annoying. They don't cure anybody, just like alcohol doesn't cure anybody. But it can make you a bit more happy, okay? It's very much the same. So, um, uh, since it is impossible to uh, train doctors into using psychiatric drugs very, very little and mostly in acute situations and when the patients ask for it, then I've come to the conclusion it would be better for humanity if we took all the drugs off the market that would be better. We would have a healthier population and they would live longer. We wouldn't kill so many people. But of course this is a controversial view, but it's based on science, the best science I could find. So um, the whole field of psychiatry is very strange. We harm so many people with these drugs and we say that they are specific, that antidepressants work for depression, I have come to the conclusion that they don't work for depression, but they give people a lot of side effects. And they increase the risk of suicide for people, not only children, but even older people. So why use drugs that increase the risk of suicide when the worst thing, what you're most worried about with depressed people is that they kill themselves. So it makes no sense to use drugs that increase the risk that they kill themselves. Um, so there is so much that is so wrong in psychiatry and uh, luckily some psychiatrists have started to realize the problems they have created. So there is, a, there is a movement in my country, in Denmark and in the United States and elsewhere towards using fewer drugs and less force 
belts and so on. But actually we should abandon all laws about forced treatment in psychiatry because it's inhumane and it's harmful. And there is a United Nations declaration about people with handicap that we have ratified and I'm sure Spain has ratified it which says we must abandon all laws in psychiatry about forced admission and forced drugging. This is inhumane and you don't do that to other patients, only psychiatric patients, and you kill some of them. It's only when you send soldiers to war that you are aware that you might kill these people. But the difference is that people decide themselves that they want to become soldiers. So they know the risk. Psychiatric patients have not decided to become psychiatric patients and run a risk of being killed by drugs that are forced upon them, although they often don't want them. So we need a complete revolution in psychiatry where we focus on psychotherapy and empathy, understanding, respecting people, even though they are psychotic. If you do that, you can calm them down when they feel they are being respected and when they feel you will not use force on them, then I can assure you that you can calm them down. Force creates, no, violence creates violence. So when psychotic patients are violent, it's often because they react towards professionals being violent towards them. So you see, we could do so much better and there are people who have shown us how we can do much better. In Finland, for example, in Lapland, they have what they call open dialogue. So if somebody gets, develops a psychosis, within 24 hours, they have a team consisting of professionals and friends perhaps and family that talks with this person and meet that person in a humane way and not with force. So the results of this are far better than traditional psychiatry. And this model is now spreading in several countries, like for example in Germany. More and more places in Germany, they adopt the open dialogue model. So it means dialogue, it means talking to the patient instead of doing something to the patient, then talk to the patient. And you should let the patient decide themselves. I have asked many patients when I lecture who have been admitted with psychosis, what do you want next time if you get a psychosis again? A benzodiazepine or an antipsychotic drug? All of them have said a benzodiazepine, please. And you know why? Because they are not so toxic as antipsychotic drugs. And they actually seem to be a little better if you want to calm people down. So why not use benzodiazepines? Um, so in my country, uh, actually at some wards, people do get benzodiazepines when they come with an acute psychosis. But not always, but we are sometimes, but they should decide for themselves. That will help them heal that they are part of the process rather than the psychiatrists becoming their masters. They should be the masters of their own life, just like you and I am the masters of our life. That would create a far better psychiatry. And it would even be uh, more attractive to be a psychiatrist because the psychiatrists don't like using force. You know, nobody likes it, so why do we have it? It's not very nice to be like a policeman. And you cannot come then later and say, oh, now I put you in bells, so I was a bad cop. But now let's have some positive interaction. Now I'm a good cop. I mean, you can't do that. The patient will be skeptical. When will I be put in bells again? or get an injection of something. So, uh, 
Yeah. It's very depressing what is going on in psychiatry. Um, I've come to the conclusion we shouldn't use antidepressant drugs at all for anybody. Because if you ask the patients, they tell you they don't work. It's only the psychiatrists that say that they work. And for example, one of the most common side effects is that half of the people who had a normal sex life get their sex life disturbed when they get antidepressant drugs. It can be lack of libido, it can be um, even impotence for the man, or no ejaculation at all. And um, isn't it strange that these pills are called happy pills when they destroy your sex life? They should be called unhappy pills. I mean, who wants to get your sex life destroyed? Nobody. So it's amazing what money and marketing and lies can do to people. They believe in all this nonsense, that these drugs are good for them. They are not. Uh, I can explain a little about ADHD drugs. Okay. Is it the word precursor? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, um, uh, some of these drugs are amphetamine. Really? Yeah. And if you buy amphetamine in the street, it's, it's uh, an illegal drug. But if you buy amphetamine on prescription, it's legal. I do that. <laughs> so th this is, of course, very strange. Mm -hmm. And the other drugs against ADHD, they have similar properties. So it's like giving children and adults a narcotic on prescription. This is what ADHD medicine is about. And uh, I find this rather horrible. And uh, particularly when you give these drugs to children, they are small developing brains. Um, it cannot be healthy to give these brains a chemical mm -hmm. that changes their brains. And it makes children more quiet, mm -hmm. which is nice for the school teachers and perhaps for the, the parents. But they also become less curious and they can become socially isolated. Mm -hmm. And we know that a developing brain needs a lot of interaction with other people. And curiosity is good for you. It develops your brain. And then we, we somehow prevent some of this. That can't be healthy. And um, we also know from animal experiments that it's likely that ADHD drugs can create permanent brain damage. But this is true for all psychiatric drugs. Mm -hmm. And why do we want to damage the brains of our children? That's not a good idea. Then many psychiatrists say that, oh well, we use these drugs in order to um, make it less likely that people will become substance abusers when they grow up or will become uh, criminals. Uh, and also so that they can achieve better in their education. There is no reliable documentation that this is the case. And the only large trial that has a long follow-up, an American trial, actually suggests the opposite. That if anything, ADHD drugs seems to make it more likely that people become drug addicts or criminals and it doesn't improve their academic performance. We are studying these drugs at my center right now. Uh, we are doing a review on Ritalin, and uh, these trials are absolutely horrible. It's among the worst science I've ever seen. So these trials are quite unreliable. They have been done by the drug industry, and often with American psychiatrists, which are deeply corrupt and receive millions from these companies. So they're not critical towards how the company analyzes and write up the results. Mm -hmm. We can see this very clearly in the, in the published reports. So um, I believe uh, that diagnosing so many children with ADHD who are more irritating and less attentive than other people 
it's a tragedy because it leads to drug treatment of them and that is really a tragedy. They need, they need human interaction and sometimes the parents need to be educated because the problem may lie with the parents mm -hmm. so that the children react on the environment they have at school and with their parents. And, and furthermore, it's often a question of time. There is a very big Canadian study of one million school children that showed that if you are born in December, then 50% more children are in treatment with ADHD drugs than if you are born in January. 50% mm -hmm. more in the same class. Why is that so? Because if you're born in January, your little brain has had 11 more months to develop and then you are not so irritating for the school teacher. You have become older, you see? This documents how big a tragedy this is, that if you are a little patient and work with these children, I mean, uh, I, I, one of my good friends is a child psychiatrist in Denmark. She takes every child off ADHD drugs. And she tells me she has never seen a single one of them becoming worse. They become better. And the parents actually appreciate to get their old child back, even though they may be more irritating. You see? So they get a true child back and not a drug child. I mean, who would want to give alcohol to a child every day and drug the child with alcohol? Nobody. But psychiatric drugs are similar to alcohol. They are very unspecific, just like alcohol. And there are some effects of alcohol that we like. Alcohol makes us more relaxed and sometimes more happy, but sometimes it makes people aggressive. And that's the same with psychiatric drugs. ADHD drugs, antidepressant drugs, antipsychotic drugs all increase violence. And so that's similar to alcohol. And um, antidepressant drugs have been involved in many school shootings in America, but it's very little investigated. So um, when terrible things happen, for example, when a psychotic patient kills somebody, then we often hear the story, oh, this is also because he stopped taking his antipsychotic drug two days before. So there you see how, bad, how good the drug is. If he had taken the drug, that might not have happened. This is the media story, but it's wrong. When you stop taking an antipsychotic drug, you can develop terrible abstinence symptoms. One of them is extreme restlessness, where you can't sit still. You must do something. This predisposes to both suicide and homicide. So when a patient has stopped his antipsychotic drug because of the horrible side effects, they talk about drug holidays, I need to get off the drug for a while, and then they can become homicidal. Then it's usually a side effect of the drug. You see the point? Mm -hmm. But in the media, it, it always becomes the opposite story. This is because he came off his drug. But my goodness, why was he put on the drug in the first place when it is so dangerous? That's a good question. What do you think about this? About the press? Yes. Well, uh, last time I was in Barcelona, I was interviewed by La Vanguardia yeah. for the back page, mm -hmm. which is very popular. Victor Amela? Victor Amela, which one? I can't remember who, who the journalist was. No, I can't remember who it was. It was a woman. Uh, Ima. Ima. And Ima, yeah, that's yeah. true, yeah. And uh, I, th I think it was a very good and interesting interview. Mm -hmm. And she wasn't allowed to publish it by her editor. Uh, which is very bad because the uh, 
the journal uh, receives support from a job company. Yeah. This is what we call corruption. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> is this usual uh, in your Not in our travels? country. Not in our country. Not no. 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 Uh, the newspapers are pretty independent in our country, but uh, it's obviously a huge problem in Spain and it's a huge problem in Russia, of course, and in many other countries and in the United States it's even a problem. Mm -hmm. There is not so much free press left in the world. Economic interests take over the press. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's a big problem for our democracies. Yes, it is. She wants to know what this subtitle means, uh, organized denial. This is quite interesting. I, um, I worked out 18 different titles for my book before I took this one. It's a very short title and it tells you a lot. So what do I mean with organized denial? I mean, of course, the psychiatrists organize denial. They have built up a fairy tale that, that we call biological psychiatry. Many of them still say that you are ill because you have a chemical imbalance in your brain. This is a huge lie. This has never been shown in scientific studies to be true. But half of the patients have been told, I'm ill because I have a chemical imbalance. It's precisely the opposite, that when you get a drug, you change the brain, so you, the drug creates a chemical imbalance. It wasn't there to begin with, but it creates a chemical imbalance. And therefore, when you try to get off the drug, you can develop abstinence symptoms, which the English call a cold turkey. So they have built up a fairy tale around these drugs and how they work that is not correct. So this I call organized denial uh, because they deny how dangerous these drugs are and uh, psychiatrists almost always deny that antidepressants can make you dependent. They accept that benzodiazepines can make you dependent but then they say, oh no, that's not a problem with antidepressants. That's another lie. If you ask the patients, which has been done many times, Half of them say, yes, I become dependent on these drugs. I have difficulty stopping them again. And I had a PhD student that compared benzodiazepine symptoms with antidepressant symptoms when you stop. They were very, very similar. So, yes, that's another example of organized denial. They don't accept this. And why not? Because it makes it more difficult to be a psychiatrist if you give out antidepressants to so many people and then you make them drug addicts, basically. That's not very good. So then it's easier just to close your eyes and, and deny that people become dependent. Then you have a devastating denial. I have met many influential psychiatrists who write in newspapers and in scientific articles that when you give antidepressants to children, you reduce their risk of suicide. The randomized trials show the opposite. You increase their risk of suicide. Drug authorities warn all over the world against using antidepressants for children because they increase their risk of suicide. Okay? So in my view, it should be forbidden to give antidepressants to children. Some children kill themselves because of the drugs. Now, many influential psychiatrists say the opposite, based on very, very bad research. They don't want to accept that these drugs should not be used in children. I think you can understand why I call this organized denial. Uh, she, she wants to know uh, how we got this far and why are psychiatrists accepting the situation? 
I, I have asked myself many times, how has it been possible to create what looks to me to be the worst drug disaster ever in human history? How has this been possible? Uh, but, yeah, for all the money. There is an incredible amount of money in diagnosing many normal people who are sad because their sweetheart just left them, their mother died, they fail an exam, they have marital problems, then they are sad and then they get a diagnosis of depression they should never have had, and then they are treated with these drugs. They, it's, it has a lot to do with money and the enormous power of the drug industry that is so wealthy. But there are also financial incentives for doctors that are very unhealthy. If you just renew a subscription for a patient who gets an antidepressant drug, it can take you two minutes. But if you want to taper off the drug in that patient, it can take months because of the abstinence symptoms. And very few psychiatrists know how to do this. And when the psychiatrists try to stop a drug, they usually do it far too rapidly. It's very common that they, they uh, lower the dose by half, only 50%. That's far too much. Then the patients become abstinent, some of them. These abstinence symptoms can be depression. Okay? It's not a true depression, it's abstinence. Then the psychiatrist reasoned, oh, you still need the drug because now your depression came back, so I will give you the full dose again. And they won't do it again, you know? So um, they, they don't know enough about the drugs they're using, the psychiatrists. They don't. And, um, and they have this financial incentive that if they decide to use psychotherapy, it may take an hour, but they can have a lot of patients in an hour where they just renew the prescription. See, so the financial incentives are wrong because this massive use of psychiatric drugs has increased disability pensions. When usage of anti-psychiatric drugs went up, then people who came on disability pension also came up, okay, in all countries. So these drugs turn acute problems into chronic problems. They create chronic patients and they are taken away from the labor market. So it's incredibly expensive for society. It would be much cheaper if we use psychiatric drugs very little and use psychotherapy. We would have a healthier population that actually could contribute to society by being in the workforce. So it's a very, very, very bad idea, this idea about the quick fix. It doesn't work and it's incredibly expensive for society. So there are all sorts of wrong incentives that make people do the wrong things. So how can we get a cure for sadness, for example, or depression? Well, that's very easy. <laughs> not for me or not it's for very, it's, people. That... It's very, very easy. If you give an antidepressant drug to a patient with severe depression, we are not just talking about sadness, but severe depression. Mm -hmm. Then on average, after about a month, the patients will have come down to mild depression. So they have become much better from mm -hmm. severe to mild depression. What happens if you give these patients a placebo? Then it just takes one more week. Then they are also mildly depressed. And so just wait a little and patients will improve even without treatment. That's how it is to be depressed. Um, and these trials are biased because they are done by psychiatrists that are paid by the industry to do them. Mm -hmm. And they are not adequately blinded because these drugs have side effects 
So in many cases, both patients and doctors know that you get an active drug and you get placebo, and then the psychiatrists exaggerate the effect. That's very human. So if you put something into the placebo that also gives, gives people side effects, so that they don't know who got a drug and who got a placebo, then there is no effect of antidepressant <coughs> drugs. It's gone. But do you think it's something for DNA, like uh, another thing, that you have a pathology because your DNA? No. No, 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 no. You can forget all that. <laughs> no, 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 no. There is so much false science in psychiatry. They say all sorts of things that are not true. Um, excuse me, what about um, an antidepressant? very carefully controlled treatment accompanied by psychotherapy? Well, first of all, you, people can disagree with me, but I have studied the science very carefully and I've come to the conclusion antidepressants don't work. They just harm people. So you shouldn't use them. You shouldn't use them in combination with psychotherapy. And I can tell you why. Antidepressants do have some effects. For example, they ruin people's sex lives. So they do have some effects. And they can actually make some people euphoric so that they become more happy. But then the psychiatrist may say, oh, now you have become bipolar. Because now you're not only depressed, but also sometimes manic. But this is a side effect of the drug. So that's wrong in many cases. Now, uh, you, If you want to help people with a depression by psychotherapy, then it is not a good idea first to numb their feelings, because that's what antidepressants do. They feel less, both less happiness and less sadness. They feel less, okay? Yes. And, And uh, psychotherapy has a lot to do with working with people's feelings. Often people's feelings go wrong when they become psychiatric patients. It has a lot to do with feelings that people react on in a not very good way, or thoughts that they react on in a not very good way. You can work with that with psychotherapy, but not so well if you first numb the patient. I mean, if, if you want to use psychotherapy, you don't ask people to drink half a bottle of vodka first, do you? That would be crazy, because then, well, the patient will not be so receptive because the patient is drunk. So if you try to think in the same way with drugs, why would you do that? It doesn't make sense. Well, I saw cases in which um, in which people were really at the risk of suicide and they were given very mild doses of antidepressants combined with psychotherapy and stopped the antidepressants once the risk was stopped and then follow it with psychotherapy and while well, they're still alive. Antidepressants increase the risk of suicide and there is no upper age limit where they are safe. It's wrong to say it's only children and adolescents that are at increased risk of suicide. No, no, no. It's wrong to say that. We have studied the literature and there are many, many more suicides on drugs than what has been communicated to the public. Many suicides are missing. So, I have come to the conclusion that it is likely that antidepressant drugs increase the risk of suicide even in middle-aged people, for example, why would you use a drug to prevent suicide when it increases the risk of suicide? This is wrong. That is malpractice. No, you shouldn't do that. There are studies that suggest that psychotherapy can reduce the risk of suicide, So drugs increase the risk of suicide, don't use them. Psychotherapy seems to be able to decrease the risk of suicide. That's why, that's one of the reasons why you should use psychotherapy. If you can explain more or less the studies, documentation, science 
in which you based your conclusions. And the second question is, uh, who is this book directed to? Target. The, yeah. Target. Yeah. Because, because she says that uh, she read somewhere that it was to young mm -hmm. professionals and doctors. Well, um, the documentation for my conclusions are in the book. Okay. Uh, um, there are lots of references in the book. So people can see how I came to my conclusions. And they can discuss it with me, which I hope they will do, uh, so that we can all become wiser. Science develops that way, mm -hmm. that you discuss things. And uh, I wrote the book primarily for the patients and their relatives, because they are being harmed so tremendously with psychiatric drugs. But I also wrote the book for young psychiatrists in training, hoping that the book can influence them so that they decide we want to revolutionize psychiatry because current level psychiatry is harmful because we use these drugs far too much. So we need a new psychiatry. You cannot change the old ones. You know, you can't. Yeah. You can't train a dog, an old dog. You can't change old people. And if they have felt for 30 years, if they have believed in the chemical imbalance nonsense and uh, believed that these drugs are very helpful, how can such a person look in the mirror and say, oh my goodness, I have harmed my patients for 30 years. I was wrong. That's very difficult for people. It's much easier just to go on harming people and then tell yourself, I'm helping people. I'm a good doctor, okay? That's much easier. So we need to get the message out to young people before they become too brainwashed by the old ones. And unfortunately, this happens. I have talked to many young psychiatrists who were very, very sorrow about what they saw in psychiatric departments. And I'll give you just one example. Uh, a young woman in training um, uh, took over the outpatient uh, department from her chief physician. So she, she saw these patients who were not in hospital but came in and went home and so on. And then she started to taper off their drugs so that they could come off their drugs. And when her boss saw this, he became very angry. You are not allowed to change this medicine. They should go on with it. And what about if she asked, for how long? Shouldn't we try to see whether they have become healthy and don't need the drugs? That was not what he wanted. So she was desperate. And I told her, psychiatry need people like you. She thought about quitting psychiatry. It was too much for her. And I said, no, don't quit psychiatry. It needs people. The patients need people like you so that we can revolutionize psychiatry. You are doing the right thing, okay? She says that uh, she feels that one of the reasons for this is that this is a sick society already. And she wants to know until what extent this sick society made us going this far. You can say it's a rather sick society, and I agree with that. Um, we have allowed capitalism to go too far when it comes to healthcare. To take care of sick people is not really compatible with capitalism. It's something else. It's about caring for people. And uh, you can look to America, where uh, America uses about twice as much per head in uh, expenditures in healthcare as we do in Europe, twice as much. And the results are much, much worse. The results for everything. Maternal mortality, child mortality, how, how old you become, even affluent Americans, rich Americans, they live shorter than in Europe. Although 
they get so much health care. But I would say it's not although they get so much health care. It's because they get so much health care. Because then they get too many dangerous drugs and too many dangerous unnecessary operations that kill them and so on. That's why. For, for the rich ones. But it's the same for the poor ones. So it goes very badly in America, where they use double as much money as we do in Europe, of our gross natural product on healthcare. They have the worst results. So this tells you a lot about how sick our societies have become. And just look to America. Now England uh, went out of the European Union. And they look to America. They have done that for a long time. They have privatized their national health service in England to a large extent. And now their results are poor. They are intermediate between the poor American results and the good Central European results. So it's very clear that the more you privatize healthcare, the worse it becomes. This is a public thing to care about other people. It's not a capitalistic thing. And how, how can we reverse it now? Well, by, by working in the opposite direction to... Um, yeah, but many people live and work in these companies and are uh, still living with this. So well, well I, have, I have been part of a working group under the Dutch Euro European Union chairmanship that ended here in, in June. Uh, we were asked to come up with creative scenarios to somehow uh, work with the problem of the very high drug prices. There is no free market. You know this drug against hepatitis C, mm -hmm. that when a, when a company has a monopoly, they take as much money as they care. So this is, this is threatening our societies. It's like pirating. It's like when Somali pirates take a hostage, they claim some millions to liberate the hostage, but here it's some millions perhaps every year for one patient. We should not allow this. So we have come up with a scenario where patents on drugs are no longer allowed and where drug development becomes a public enterprise for the public good and meeting the needs of patients and not just coming with other similar drugs as poor drugs we already have, but actually do some real research that benefits the patients. So that's what we have suggested, that uh, capitalism is very bad for giving us the drugs we need and for affording the drugs we need. We can't afford them because they are monopolies. So we need to get rid of patents and we need to have public drug development it is already the case that most breakthroughs in drug treatment, they come from publicly funded research and not from the drug industry. So we might as well take the full step and say, okay, we make it a full public enterprise to develop and market drugs. And then we can price them so low so that everybody can afford them, even in developing countries. So we increase their prosperity. But many times public drugs are worse than the other ones. Public drugs? Yeah. No, no, that's a total misconception. I just told you that most breakthroughs in drug treatment come from publicly funded laboratories. They do. Because these people who are publicly funded, they don't work for money. They want to help the world which is much funnier than working for money. Money, that's... Yeah, but for example, I suffer from asthma and sometimes some pills and some uh, or ventolin is better than another public drug. Well, don't, don't talk about concrete examples. I am telling you, it has been documented that most breakthroughs come from publicly funded research. It's also absolutely clear that the drug industry extorts us, like people who take hostages. Mm -hmm. So the current system is not sustainable. It cannot go on. We need a completely new system. So this is what we have suggested, and we have written an article about it um, that we will publish or yeah, submit before too long, so then we can discuss this. So 
How can a simple ibuprofen will kill somebody? A pill. It doubles the risk of getting a heart attack. So it kills really? a lot. Of, it kills a lot of people. You should never go to the pharmacy and buy ibuprofen. It's too dangerous, and you don't need it. I mean, if you have pain, you don't need that drug. You can just live with your pain, and or you can take a paracetamol. It's better paracetamol. Well, it it, do, it doesn't double the risk of getting a heart attack. I mean, it's crazy. If you have pain somewhere. Why would you take a drug that doubles your risk of getting a heart attack? It doesn't make any sense. People doesn't know that. No, that's why I write books. <laughs> Have you ever been threatened or pressured in any way so you wouldn't publish this? No. I can't be stopped. <laughs> <laughs> But have, have they tried? No. Really? Yeah. It's too late. When the book is out, you can't do anything. Okay. Denmark, can... is, Denmark is the happiest country in the world. Uh, yeah. yeah. Why? <laughs> well, I, yeah, I can tell you why. Um, happiness in countries have a lot to do with trust. And in Denmark, we trust each other. We trust our politicians. You don't do that in Spain. No. Not at all. And we have a very low level of corruption in Denmark, which is vital for a country's happiness. And then we have a high level of personal freedom to do what we want, to write and say what we want, which is also very important for happiness personal freedom. So we, we have that very much in Denmark. And then, thirdly, we have, even back to the Vikings, we have respected our women, always. So there has been much more equality between males and females in the Nordic countries than in the Southern European countries. And if you look to the Arab countries, it's absolutely horrible. Of course, this also contributes to happiness, that we respect each other, no matter whether you're a man or a woman. So, I've just given you a few examples. <laughs> In your me medical point of view. About what? About the happiness. Medical? Uh, yeah. That's not a medical issue. Th this, this is an issue about everything else. Well, what do you mean? I mean the, the institutions. Um, medical institutions What's in the Denmark oh. is is all different here that 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 institution here in Spain or in the so I don't here I don't know really um, we we have private practice in Denmark of course we have private specialists and so on and you have the same in Spain and uh, I don't know how it compares between Denmark and Spain. But I can tell you, we have very few private hospitals in Denmark. And uh, it has been shown that uh, you don't benefit from private hospitals if you're a patient. Um, that has been shown in a study from Canada, I think. That, yeah, that was a Canadian study. And uh, why is that so? Well, if you have a private hospital, you all the time have economic considerations. Do I really want to give that patient that expensive treatment? Uh, it would cost us too much, perhaps, if, the, for example, the patient might not be able to afford the treatment and so on. You, you might lose money. Uh, whereas in the public sector, in public hospitals, Doctors tend to do what they think patients need, and they don't think about costs really, uh, not very much at least. Uh, so in private hospitals it's different, and um, yeah, uh, there are many good reasons for uh, understanding why it is that Danish doctors are very left-wing when it comes to healthcare. Then they are glowing red 
many of them. That's because capitalism is bad for healthcare. They might not be right wing in other matters, but if you talk to Danish doctors about healthcare, they are pretty left wing. Uh, you've written a book about mammographies. Yes. And even if it's not the subject of this chat today, she wanted you to sum up a little what you say about mammographs in, in that book, considering that it's getting fashionable now. Oh, here. well, well um, <clears throat> we were not interested in mammography screening at all, but the Danish National Board of Health asked us to look into this subject in 1999. And uh, we looked at the randomized trials and concluded that um, maybe mammography screening did more harm than good. Or maybe it did more good than harm, but we didn't know at that time. Then we have done a Cochrane review on mammography screening, and we have, we have been more deep into these trials than anybody else in the world. I'm convinced about that. Um, and uh, we have studied mammography screening in all these years and have published many scientific articles about it. And uh, our conclusion is that mammography screening does more good than harm, definitely. There are no data that suggests that it helps women live longer. If there is any effect of mammography screening on breast cancer mortality, it is very small. But when you screen healthy women, you detect a lot in their breasts that you should never have detected because it is harmless. It is like the prostates of males. We don't take a PSA because uh, more than 60% of males at my age have prostate cancer, but don't find it, don't find it. I mean, most of it is innocent. It won't kill us. It's the same with breast cancer. So when you screen for breast cancer, you find a lot of harmless cancers, but you cannot distinguish between whether it's dangerous or harmless. So you treat all of them. And when you treat harmless breast cancers with radiotherapy, you kill some of the healthy women because they get heart disease or they develop new cancers because of the radiotherapy. So if you save a few women from dying in breast cancer because of breast screening, then you kill a similar number of healthy women. So there is no survival benefit. And, but there is a lot of harm. If you go to screening for 20 years, for example, one quarter or in some countries, one half of the women will get at least one false, di one, one false diagnosis which means that they get a message. We don't know what it is, but it might be cancer. It might not be cancer. You need to come back. We will take new pictures or we will do a biopsy or whatever. This has big effects on women psychologically. Even three years after they got a false positive diagnosis and was told it wasn't cancer, you can be happy. There's nothing. Even three years later, they still worry. Well, well, maybe they were wrong. Maybe I do have cancer. So if you add these psychological side effects to the fact that it doesn't help people live longer, then it's inevitable that mammography screening is harmful. You cannot come to any other conclusion. So I published a paper maybe two years ago where I concluded that mammography screening should be stopped. It's harmful. And uh, some well-educated women, uh, they realize this. For example, the editor of the British Medical Journal, Fiona Godley. I gave a talk on mammography screening in Oxford a couple of years ago for 800 people from the whole world and explained to them why it was harmful. And to my big surprise, I didn't get one critical question from the audience. They asked me, what should we then do? What should we then offer the women? And I said, Nothing. Do you know the tune? Don't worry, be happy. We don't offer males anything. We don't tell them to get a PSA screen because it's harmful for them. It's the same with women. Be happy. You should not offer them anything. It's only because you have been brainwashed 
for 30 years into believing mammography screening is good for women, that you feel, oh, if we don't use mammography screen, we must offer them something else. Forget about it. And then, then Fiona Godley, she was chairwoman. She told the whole audience, I got my first invitation for mammography screening recently, but since I know Peter's research very well, I declined. So it's, it's, it's out in, on YouTube. But it helps to prevent, maybe, the part of the woman that has this disease may help to survive. No. No, I just told you that there is absolutely no science that suggests that women live longer if they go to mammography screening. I also told you that if it saves a few lives, it is very few lives, and it kills as many because of overdiagnosis and overtreatment. So it doesn't do any good. I'm sorry, but that's what the science tells me. So I don't understand why we are doing this. It's again no. my reflection. No but, some, no, but you, you, you are not at, the, at an age where you get invited to a mammography screening. You are young. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I am, but my mother, uh, no, and he has... Yeah. Tell her. She has a lot of mammographies. Yeah. To, tell to her control. Not, uh, tell her not to do it, please. Well, I can't. No. My yes. mother had hundred cancer when she was pregnant. I was inside. Yeah. And she's alive now because she wanted or to juicy. be treated. Yeah. So. Thank you. Yeah. I think it makes helps. What helps? Because if not, I won't be here. What helps? Mammographies. Wait a minute. If you have a suspicion of cancer because you take a shower and you see something you haven't seen before, of course you get a mammography. That's part of the diagnostic tools. Mm -hmm. But mammography screening is another issue. It's harmful. Mm -hmm. You just shouldn't do it. It should be stopped in all countries. Very easy. Only controls, not mammographies in general. I'm talking, about, I'm talking about, it's not preventing anything. I'm talking about mammography screening. Mm -hmm. And mammography screening cannot prevent breast cancer. It just detects breast cancer and it detects far too much breast cancer. So it's not prevention. It's wrong to use the word prevention. Mm -hmm. It has nothing to do with prevention. You see, the whole semantics is seducing. Mm -hmm. I know that. People call it prevention. It's not prevention to detect a cancer. How can that be prevention? It's not. Do you still believe in medicine? I don't believe in anything. I'm a science. I'm a scientist. <laughs> I question everything. <laughs> See? Psychiatrists, uh, medicine, psychopharmacs are the third cause of death after cancer and heart, heart attacks. See. Uh, could you improve on that? Yeah. I looked for the best science I could find to find out how deadly psychiatric drugs are. This is very difficult. Um, for example, you cannot use trials in schizophrenia to find out how lethal antipsychotic drugs are because trials in schizophrenia are usually made in this way that you take patients who are already on an antipsychotic drug and then you randomize them to placebo or another antipsychotic drug. This means that you are harming the placebo group because some of them develop terrible abstinence symptoms that predisposes to violence, to suicide and homicide. Okay? So you are harming the placebo group. And then you say, okay, I have a good drug because it's better than when I'm harming patients in the placebo group. That doesn't make any sense. So you are artificially increasing the death rate in the placebo group. This design is lethal. I write in my book that, uh, that one out of around 150 people in these schizophrenia trials who were randomized to placebo, they died. One out of 150, that's very many. And 
I think a good deal of these people killed themselves because they developed so terrible abstinence symptoms that they couldn't exist and killed themselves. So you cannot use these trials to see how lethal antipsychotic drugs are when you actually had a design that killed a lot of people in the placebo group. You see? So therefore I went to old people uh, because antipsychotics have been tried in people with dementia, which is crazy. I mean, why would you use a toxic drug in people who have dementia? But that's very crazy. But there are trials of this kind. And then I thought, well, they might not have been on an antipsychotic drug before they were randomized to placebo and a drug. So these trials are likely more than reliable. And then I could see that one out of a hundred are killed of the old people when they get an antipsychotic drug for just some weeks, then one out of a hundred are killed compared to placebo. Suicide? No, they're just killed. I mean, uh, they, uh, one of the common reasons is that uh, they lose balance and fall, then they break their hip, and then 20% will be dead within the next year. That's a very common reason why psych psychiatric drugs kill a lot of uh, elderly people that they lose balance. Everything that affects the brain affects your balance. It's not only alcohol. So um, that was the case for antipsychotics and then it became more difficult, for example, for antidepressants. How was I going to find out how lethal they are? That's very, that was very difficult. Then I found a very good study from the British Medical Journal where people over 65 were their own control, so in one period they got an antidepressant and in another they didn't get an antidepressant. And then I could work out how many died when they got an antidepressant. And of course, these studies that are not randomized trials, they are not equally reliable as randomized trials, but I, I found the best evidence there was. So this is my conclusion, and I may be wrong, Maybe they are not so lethal, but even if I should be proven wrong, they do kill a lot of people. So whether it's the third leading cause of death or the fourth or the fifth, it doesn't really matter. They kill an enormous amount of people. There's no question about that. Thank you very much. You are very, very brave. brave. <laughs> you are very, very brave. brave. Revolutionary. No, I'm not brave. I'm, I just have a love for honesty. It's time for time for two. It's time for time for two. It's time for time for two. It's time 